Hello and welcome to Ramblings with a 42 year old man, Chris Smith here with you and we're going to have a special episode today kind of circling around the um, Death Gates cycle which is a series of books that came out in the early 90s and um, <clears throat> is actually my favorite book series of all time. Uh, I recently uh, got all seven of these books on uh, Audible. They were recently released on Audible for um, audiobook format uh, for the first time. So I listened to them all recently. And so I just want to do a kind of a, a episode centering around this series. So I uh, will get into a little bit of the, uh, the background of the book, the authors, uh, and then we'll do kind of quick recaps of the seven books. I'll try to keep it spoiler free so much i mean these books have been out for you know 30 plus years at this point but uh i'm not gonna get into huge spoilers but there will be some so if anybody is interested in picking these up you may want to just do so before listening but um anyway we'll get into a little bit of conversation about each of the books there are seven of them and um and then we'll circle around on my final thoughts so please stay tuned All right, so The Death Gate Cycle. It's a series of seven uh, science fiction slash fantasy novels, um, kind of very similar to uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Dragonlance uh, format. The two authors for this series is uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, who are kind of known as the creators of Dragonlance. It's kind of like an alternate Dungeons and Dragons kind of deal. They, they have written over like 20 different books in this Dragonlance world. Uh, now, the Death Gate Cycle is not actually part of Dragonlance. There's a whole new world that they decided to create, a whole new seven-book series separate from all of their Dragonlance stuff. Uh, but Dragonlance is kind of their bread and butter. They've done uh, role-playing games based on it. They've done all the books. There's video games. Uh, you know, Dragonlance is kind of a pretty big um, science fiction fantasy series. Um, but Death Gate is by far my favorite work of theirs. And uh, so, yeah, seven books released anywhere between 1990 and 1994 is when finally that, that seventh book came out. And um, I read these probably right after the seventh book came out. Um, I know my, my mom had been really into them, and she recommended them to me. I was probably 14, 15 at the time, uh, and I devoured all seven of them. It's the first time I'd read books where by the end, when it was over, I was actually depressed that it was over i remember being like there's no not more to, to to look into for these characters and being very um kind of just despondent about it a little bit but that's just how strong the characters were and the story was and uh, it was definitely the first time i felt that way and i think that's why even now you know 30 years later i am still uh this is still my favorite uh, book series even with all the you know harry potter's a great book series the lord of the rings the witchers there's some really amazing book series that are probably to better than this series but this was the first one that really touched me this way so that's what makes it my favorite um so this one centers around uh the main conflict is around these two races uh they're they're both kind of human style races but they have grown so much in magical power that they've kind of separated into almost godlike beings um and they're kind of always warring against each other and fighting against each other you got the the sartans and the patrons and kind of light and dark magic maybe a little bit although there's a lot of, of gray in there too there's not really a good or dark or good or bad on both on either side there's kind of a mix across all of them uh, but what ends up happening is the sardin who are kind of thought of as the more benevolent ones decide that the only way to stop the patrons from kind of taking over the world is to break it apart and recreate it into whole new uh worlds and so they take the one earth break it into four different worlds uh, they create a separate kind of prison world, which is where they put the patrons. Um, it's supposed to be a world that's going to, over time, teach the patrons how to, um, you know, love and not be so uh, trying to take everything over. It's supposed to kind of rehabilitate them. Uh, unfortunately, something goes wrong with the magic, and that prison ends up becoming a death trap for, for many of them. And patrons spend generations trying to escape uh, that, that um, prison that's starting to create uh, same thing with the four worlds. Uh, the magic never quite got to what it needed to, and these four worlds were supposed to kind of work together s to sustain each other never actually takes place. Um, so by the time we're launched into the story, this is our, this has been hundreds of years after the, this has all happened, um, and all these worlds have their own issues going on, and um, it, a patron finally escapes from the labyrinth to this uh, kind of center city that was created by the sergeant kind of for the, the patrons to live in when they've been rehabilitated from the from the labyrinth the prison uh called the labyrinth and uh, this patron um kind of accumulates other patrons that that are able to escape from the labyrinth he helps them to escape and he kind of starts creating his army or his city you know his followers 
Um, one of his followers is a character named Haplo, and Haplo is going to be sent by this Lord of the Pat Patrons to um, investigate the Four Worlds, uh, see what's going on, see if there's anything he can do to pretty much make it to where, where when the Lord comes to the world, the, the worlds will think of him as the Savior and look up to him, and he can kind of run the Four Worlds. Uh, so Patrons, uh, Haplo is kind of his scout. Uh, so the first four books of the series follow that pattern pretty well. Haplo goes to each of the four worlds. And, you know, the first couple books, Haplo is not particularly a great guy. You know, he's your main character, but he's kind of, you know, he, he's in there to foster chaos so that his lord can come take over these worlds. You know, he's not necessarily a good person. He's kind of stoic. He's very rough. He's very, you know... Um, he thinks himself better than the people he's seen because he thinks himself like this godlike being. Uh, but slowly, especially by like the third and fourth book, especially, uh, you start to see this huge character arc for him where he starts to change. And, and then when you get into the fifth, sixth, and seventh books later, completely a uh, new outlook in this character, and you, you love him. And um, so you got him uh, on the other side of things. You've got Alfred. He is a character who you'll find in the first book who's actually one of the last Sartan. Uh, living on that world and um, he kind of the, the flip side of Haplo he also is kind of this godlike uh, you know magical being but he does not think so of himself he he, he kind of he hides himself he makes himself look clumsy and silly and kind of you know it's always just bumbling into things and and fainting whenever things look uh, like things are getting intense you know so very very much trying to hide the fact that he's got all this power and, he, and even to himself like he doesn't really feel that powerful because he's he's believed in this 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 being that that this way that he's turned himself into this bumbling kind of oafish guy um and the the crux of the of the seven books is really those two characters bouncing off each other um and then how each of these four worlds and the characters we meet on each of these four worlds interact and then by the by the fifth sixth and seventh there's kind of a new thread out there that that comes across and we'll get there when we talk a little bit about the different books uh but that's kind of your main your main crux so the the first four books is each an individual world that we're going to go visit and then the fifth sixth and seventh is kind of all these stories kind of coming together uh culminating in a, a final showdown in the seventh book uh, so that we'll go ahead and get started with uh, each book in the series. We'll talk a little bit about each one. Again, I'm going to try to keep spoilers to a minimum, uh, but some of the characters that you'll see going throughout the series may have a little, you know, spoilers of, of, you know, obviously they made it through this book, so now they're in this book, you know, so just FYI there. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about each of them a little bit and uh, then follow up with just final thoughts on the series. All right, so book one of the Death Gate Cycle is called Dragon Wing, and this was released in 1990. And uh, character-wise, we're going to meet Haplo, and then we're going to meet a whole lot of characters uh, kind of centered in this one world. And this world is the world of air, which is Arianus. Uh, and in this world, is it's definitely, it's, like it says, it's a world of air. It's floating islands kind of going through this, this you know, just open air space. Uh, there's a lower realm, uh, which is where the, the dwarves all live, and they kind of dig into caves and stuff down there. Uh, the mid-realm, human and elves live, and they're constantly at war with each other. And then you got an upper realm, which has like some mysterious uh, human mages have gone up there, and that's where they live. And we'll kind of run into each of those realms during this book. Um, so we start off each of these kind of four books with, with Haplo going off on his journey into each of the four worlds. Uh, and then we introduce a lot of the different characters from each of these worlds. So we meet Hugh the Hand here. He's going to be big in the series. Uh, he's an assassin. Uh, he gets hired by the human king to actually take his his young, like I think he's like seven, seven-year-old uh, son, who um, is not really the king's son. There's a whole backstory about why the king wants this this boy taken out um but yeah he hires you the hand to take his son away and, and murder him pretty much um there's a whole lot of back reasons for it uh, i won't get into that now but that's kind of how hugh's story gets started uh he ends up running into alfred the the sergeant who i talked about at the beginning who is hiding he's not showing himself as a sergeant he's actually been in kind of hiding as the chambermaid i think they call him he, he's like kind of like the prince's servant uh so he tags along as well um now it's whether or not he knows what he has been hired to do is kind of, you know, questionable throughout most of the story. Uh, but he is there as well. So it's Hugh, Bane is the name of the prince, and then uh, Alfred is kind of on their little journey. Uh, to the side of that journey, you got the dwarves down in the lower realm. Uh, there's a character named Limbeck uh, and his girlfriend Jar Jare. And um, they're kind of leading a resistance uh, 
of their dwarves because the, what the dwarves have pretty much done is they work on this machine down the lower realm called the Kixi Winzy. This machine, which was created by the Sartan, obviously, but nobody knows what it's actually supposed to do. It just runs. It's just always running. It's always building and destroying and then building new things. And the dwarves have spent their entire existence just maintaining this machine, not even really knowing why. That's just, it's almost like, like the religion is just maintaining this machine. Uh, and Limbeck was leading a resistance force who's kind of like, we should not be doing this. We should be finding out why the machine does this. Why is the machine doing that? And that's considered heretical by the, the dwarves. So uh, a lot of his story is fighting against um, his, his own people. Not fighting, but just, you know, peaceful resisting is what he's, he's done. Um, and he ends up finding Haplo because when Haplo comes into this world, he comes in uh, in this lower realm and this giant lightning storm and his ship crashes and he gets knocked out and Limbeck finds him. And so Haplo's down with the dwarves. Hugh and Bane and Alfred are up in the middle realms doing their thing. Eventually they come down. They all end up meeting up. And um, then they all end up going up into the, the high realm where they meet human mages, including one uh, named Sinistred, who's kind of the machinations for all the stuff that's going on with the prince and the mid-realm and everything. And uh, anyway, that's where kind of our final showdown happens for Dragonwing. But the biggest point of this book is, um, you know, we're introduced to Haplo, his... His plan of, of coming to the worlds, finding out what's what is what, and kind of fostering chaos. Uh, we're introduced to Hugh, who is uh, going to be kind of a big character in future books as well. He's he's almost Hugh. I'd almost consider more the main character of this first book. We probably spend more time with him than just about anybody. Um, then you got Alfred and Haplo kind of mixed in there. Limbeck kind of mixed in there, and um, and then the character of Bane, this prince, who's actually kind of got a lot of magical properties and stuff himself. Um, ends up being pretty integral in the story as well. And so that's kind of Dragon Wing. Uh, that first world of Ariana's, we spend the entire book on that one world. Um, other than a quick little thing at the beginning where Haplo gets sent on his journey from the Nexus, which is the city of the, the patrons that have escaped from the labyrinth to live in. And uh, so yeah, that's Dragon Wing. It's kind of your introduction to everything. Uh, we meet a lot of cool characters. Uh, what's really interesting about this the seven gate series is really other than haplo and alfred a lot of these characters are only here for these one books these books that are taking place in this world and then when we get to books five six and seven there's some interactions with some of them again as well but for the first four books we're going to leave a lot of this these characters we met in this one book behind and really just follow haplo and alfred who kind of comes in and out of the story as well but yeah that's dragon wing that's the end of the first uh book i don't think i had a whole lot of spoilers on there but uh just just you know good introduction to the to this uh the, the plan and the outline for the series uh you are definitely going to be seeing a world at a time as you go forward and we're going to see that with the second story and how that is um quite different from the world that we've gotten to know in this one book the name of the second book in the seventh gate uh the seventh series of death gate seven book series of death gate i'm gonna get it out eventually um, is called Elven Star. Now, Elven Star takes place in the world of fire. And you start thinking, oh, world of fire, maybe it's going to be like a volcanic land. Or there's going to be lava everywhere or something. We'll see a, a world similar to that later. But the world of fire is called such because it is unending sunlight. There's never, you know, a night. There's always a sun. And so the world has been overgrown with, with green and trees and plants because the in, unending sunlight, you know. Um, you would think maybe a desert world, but no, there's also, there's rains and stuff that, that really makes the world very lush. Um, and we are introduced to our characters for this book. You know, obviously we've had Haplo coming into the world again to, to foster chaos and kind of get it prepared for his lord. Uh, but the individual characters of this story is a uh, group of humans, elves and dwarves that kind of live on the treetops of this land. The elves and the humans work together a little bit, but there, there's still a lot of tensions in there. Um, the dwarves kind of stay on the... Uh, in their own kind of underneath the treetops living in, in the version of case for this world they don't live underground it's actually just under the treetops in the dark that's where the dwarves of this world are um but what happens is these giant um kind of cam kind of green camouflage looking creatures start coming from the north and they're asking one question of everybody they meet and it's where is the citadel and when nobody knows what they're talking about they get violent and start just destroying kingdoms and destroying people and killing all sorts of, of every, everybody pretty much just a path of destruction coming from the north uh so it hits the dwarven lands first then it hits the human lands and it comes in the elfin lands and we've got kind of a crew of uh, a couple of elves uh Pathan and his sister aletha then we've got um 
couple of humans, Roland and his sister, um, Riga, and then one dwarf uh, named uh, Druger. And they all kind of make this little unit trying to escape the, uh, the Titans. Uh, at the same time this is happening, um, we are introduced to a character of Zifnab. Now, Zifnab is a wizard um, who is, he's played a lot for laughs. And uh, he also is a fourth wall breaking character as well. A lot of uh, jokes about uh, things that exist in our world. He, he calls himself you know, Mr. Bond at some points. He's always talking about how he's better than Gandalf and how he was better than Merlin. And, you know, he gives Star Wars references. You know, he's kind of, you know, he's this kooky old wizard, but then he's also maybe a little more shrewd than you think he is as well, you know. So is he as crazy as he plays off to be or is it part of a plan we don't really know yet? Um, he has a pet dragon also, which is very cool. The dragon's pretty, he's kind of the, who's taking care of who? Is Zifnag taking care of the dragon? There's dragon taking care of Zifnab. We don't really know that as well. Um, but he is um, kind of shows up to, to kind of give this proclamation of, "Hey, we're going to be saved. This guy's going to come up in a ship. And he's going to he's going to save us all from these titans." And guess who comes up in the ship? Haplo shows up in a ship, and all of a sudden he gets there just in time to see the titans coming up on all these um, the, the the humans and the elves and the dwarf come running up to the, the ship like, "Hey, you're here to save us." And he's like, "What the what the heck did I just roll into?" Of course, at this point, Haplo is still this very stoic, very you know, focused on his mission and, and does not like people much at all. And he's like, what the heck is that? Now I got all these people on my ship and I'm saving them from things. Why am I saving people? You know? Um, but anyway, it's a very cool the way it ends up going out. And, um, and so the rest of the story is kind of Haplo and these people that he saved from the Titans trying to figure out what's going on. Why are the Titans doing this? Uh, why is the, um, why are there lights in the sky that are sometimes lit up, sometimes aren't? It's almost like they're stars, but they're not really stars. We find out about those. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of the, the, the crux of this world. Um, and again, very similar to what was with the first book. We have a whole new group of characters other than the Haplo character. Uh, yeah, a whole new group of characters we're introduced to. This is all of their story on this world. And then guess what? When this book is over, we're not going to see them again for a while because we're moving on to different worlds. Um, but yeah, so Elven Star is, I think, is a, a upgrade from Dragon Wing. I really do enjoy uh kind of the setup with Dragon Wing. I love the character of Hugh the Hand, but everything there is, seems a little more, I mean, a little, I guess a little more kind of toned down, a little more realistic almost, even though you're living in this world of air on floating islands, but it almost plays more like a medieval uh, story. You're jumping into this and all of a sudden you're in fantastical trees that, that you can walk on the tops of and there's lakes and the moss beds and you got dragons and you got titans and it gets a little more fantasy. It feels a lot more fantasy than the than the first book does, which the same thing. Mean, there's a whole bunch of dragons in all these books, but just the first one is a little more toned down and then by the second book we're getting a lot more um, just fantastical, I feel. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. And you start to see Haplo's little cracks in his foundation a little bit here you know he's still the stoic and grumpy guy but you see a little bit more personality uh coming out of him we're getting these little flashbacks of when he was li living in the labyrinth as well uh specifically he had a, a, um, a woman that he was kind of partnered with for a major for quite a bit of his time in the labyrinth that he you know thinks about a lot um and uh, we'll get to know her a little bit later as we move on but that is uh elven star and that's the second book and that'll kind of lead us into our next world which we'll get into next Book three is called Fire Sea, and this one takes place in the land of stone. Uh, so you remember uh, with Elven Star, we're talking about how it was the land of fire, and maybe you're thinking lava and volcanoes. That's what this is. This is the land of stone. Uh, the, the world itself is kind of inside, so it's kind of in caves and, and molten, you know, center, and there is a lot of lava and magma and stuff in this world. Um, so in this world... There are no humans, there are no elves, there are no dwarves. They have all died out because it's almost impossible to live because of all the gases that is created by the lava and everything. And the Sardin magic that was supposed to keep everybody alive has failed because the all the four worlds which are supposed to kind of be working together um, to keep each of them running is not happening. And this world specifically has just... Everything has died out. The, the only people that still exist in this world are Sartan. And even they are barely able to do it because their magic is having to keep work so hard to keep them alive that their magical skills have come down, you know, far from where they began. Um, the biggest thing in this world is they have, because so many of their people have died and, and it's hard to, you know, keep people working and stuff because they're having to use so much of their magic to stay alive, they have learned the forbidden art of necromancy. And so when their people die, they bring them back to life. And when they bring them back to life, they don't come to life like, like they're normal anymore. They come to life like 
like walking corpses pretty much and they send them to work the corpses work the fields or they work the building things like they have, the armies are made of up of the of dead sardin and it's it's very very creepy this is very think like like the black cauldron like the 80s disney movie you know you got the army and the dead and stuff it's, it's similar to that kind of vibe and so very very creepy and uh, this is kind of the, the the one book that's maybe closest to like a sci-fi fantasy horror book which of course i would love <laughs> But uh, Haplo gets into this world. Um, Alfred some, is finally shows up again. We missed Alfred in the second book. He wasn't around in the second book. But in this one, he magically appears on Haplo's ship when he comes into this world. And, of course, that's interesting because, you know, they're mortal enemies. But they're having to work together to survive in this world because this world is so crazy. And it's so hard to, for people to survive. And, you know, they come across a group of, of Sarden who have traveled from... Uh, what their land which is kind of dying to this other area of other sartan where um it's being it's the the place is called necropolis which is a great, wonderful name and uh the leader of this place calls himself a dynasty he's kind of made himself king and um and so yeah it, it's very intense and when when Haplo and Alfred get there it, it's kind of there there's a prophecy that they believe in that they think Alfred or even possibly Haplo are part of and so they try to grab them and and there's a rebellion kind of against the dynasty and they kind of take Alfred and the dynasty himself gets Haplo and uh he knows about Deathgate which is the way that Haplo travels between all the worlds it's called Deathgate and so um the Sartan kind of remember about Death Game. They want to use Death Game to get off of this world because this world is so horrible and nobody is being able to survive very much. Um, and they want to use Haplo or Alfred to be able to get through Death's Gate. And there's a whole, the whole way that they end up going to, about trying to do that. Uh, by the end of the story, you know, Haplo and Alfred are trying to escape out of Necropolis and they find this, this chamber right in the middle of the catacombs underneath the city. Um, and in this chamber, they, they kind of have a vision together of um, a group of Sartan kind of post sundering when the world when these worlds kind of first got started and they talk about having kind of been felt the presence of a um, higher power and so this is kind of the start of a big 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 overarching theme for pretty much the rest of the books this idea that the sardin did this to the world and then there was they just now realize that they're not the highest power in the universe there's a higher power up there and of course what ramifications does that have that they took it upon themselves to destroy the world um, when there's this higher power out there. So there's a lot of that going for it as well. But here's just kind of the very, 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 very beginnings of it. Um, what's neat with this one, this is when we start to see uh, a, a kind of a subtle shift in Haplo. Um, when him and Alfred go through Death Skate, every time you pass through Death Skate, it's, it's, very, it's a crazy experience. You usually just get knocked out. Uh, but when Haplo and Alfred go through, they actually get kind of, their consciousnesses, consciousnesses get kind of mixed up. And Haplo and Alfred each see past events of each other's lives. So like Alfred sees Haplo trying to survive in the library. He sees his parents being killed. He sees him trying to um, live with this this woman, that uh, Merritt, who he's fallen in love with in the labyrinth. And then Haplo is in Alfred's body. He sees how, how Alfred woke up in Arianus after their kind of hibernating sleep to realize that all of his other Sardin brothers and sisters were dead and he was the only one left. And so they come to a little bit more of an understanding by each other. By the end of the book, when Haplo is leaving the world to go back to the, to his lord to kind of tell him everything about what's going on, he allows Hap, uh, Alfred to leave rather than turn him into his lord, which is, you know, obviously the Sartan should be brought to his lord if he's, if he's really following his lord's instructions. Um, but that kind of, that change in Haplo starts to take shape, uh, especially around his feelings uh, between him and Alfred. So um, by, the, by the end of the story, Haplo kind of tells the Lord not to worry about this world. It's completely dead. There's nothing going on there. He does not tell him about the necromancy because he fears that kind of magic. And he saw what it did to this world. So he doesn't even tell his Lord about it, which is kind of, again, the starts of these cracks in Haplo where he's starting to kind of think for himself and, and have um, maybe his Lord isn't the main thing in the world you know uh so yeah that's book three fire sea that's going to move us into our final of uh, the four worlds in our next book uh the serpent mage okay, so serpent mage we come to the world of water celestria and uh or celestra celestra i believe it is um and this world is com completely submerged in water but the water is breathable it's actually breathable water but there is a side effect to this water somehow this water can um, annihilate Haplo's magic whenever it touches him. And not just Haplo, evidently it does the same thing to Sartan as well. So if you get wet, your magic 
disappears. And for the patrons, I think, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but the way that magic works for the Sardin and the patrons. So Sardin magic is all about kind of drawing runes in the air and singing and stuff, and it makes the magic happen. Where patrons have the, the runes like tattooed all over them, pretty much from the neck down. They're all covered in these tattoos. Uh, when Hapla gets wet, the tattoos disappear. He loses his magic. All right, so that's kind of how he gets in this world. But this world is, again, um, humans and dwarves and elves live in this world. And here they're actually getting along, which is crazy for, for every other world they've been fighting or, or died out or whatever. But here they're actually working together. Um, they're having to travel from different sea moons, as they call them, because as the sun that's in this kind of in the middle of this ocean world moves, sea moons kind of freeze over. So they kind of have to travel and follow the sea. Um, with this movement of the sun as well, it also defrosts some area that had been frozen, which unleashes these giant sea serpents um, called dragon snakes that end up being kind of our, our primary antagonists going forward in the story. They're not actually snakes, they're just kind of like the embodiment of evil, and they can take other forms as well. Snakes just happens to be their preferred, preferred form because it strikes fear in people, and they, they live off of fear. Um, and so we have the story, we, we meet this the, these young, um, group of of they call them minch the the humans and dwarves and elves they call them minch because of the lower races where you got the sergeant and patron who take themselves above everybody uh but there's a group of girls there's a dwarf uh princess a human princess and a elf princess and the dragon snakes tell the the dwarves humans and elves that they need to sacrifice each one of one of their princesses to them and they will let them leave the sea moon in safety and follow the sun uh, of course, the parents don't want to do this, but the girls take it upon themselves to go ahead. Except the elven girl, before she can go, she tells her boyfriend, and he knocks her out and takes her place. <laughs> so it's actually the two girls and the one elven boy. Uh, this is a lake. is the human uh, girl. There you got um, Grundle, the dwarven girl, and uh, the elven boy is um, is Devon. I'm sorry, slipped my mind for a second. Um, so they're on their way to sacrifice themselves to the dragon snakes. They run into Haplo in the middle of the ocean. His ship is broken apart. And he's just kind of floating in the, in the ocean, which luckily he can breathe in. Um, but they find him and, and he joins them on the on the ship. And um, he finds the dragon snakes with them. And the dragon snakes kind of tell the, the patron, hey, um, there's a group of Sartan living in this world. And if you can you know, unite the humans to fight against the Sartan, we'll help you. And the dragon snakes, their, their whole thing is they kind of ingratiate themselves to you they tell you that they work for you they'll do whatever you want and you can do this and, and that's how they kind of get into you so Haplo is believing that he can get the help of the dragon snakes so while this is all happening Alfred appears in this world as well but not anywhere near Haplo he appears in the middle of that Sardin city that we talked about and this Sardin city is full of sleeping Sardin who when they wake up he realizes are the the Sardin who actually made the decision to sunder the world and, and split it up in these four worlds. They have been in hibernation sleep ever since. Uh, and the leader of the Sardin, Sama, is there. And, you know, there's a whole lot of political stuff going on in the Sardin. Um, even before the sundering, there are people that didn't want to happen, and there are people that did, and there's a lot of infighting. And so a lot of Alfred's side of the story is, is can he trust his own people that he's been looking for for all these books, you know? Uh, and then on Haplo's side is about uh, can he really trust these dragon snakes and he starts to kind of come to enjoy the, the humans and the dwarves and the elves that he's working with and again those, those cracks are getting bigger that cracks in his foundation he's starting to feel more he's starting to express more he's starting to think more for himself and by the end of this one it is um, it's a completely different Haplo than we started off with uh, him and Alfred had great scenes together near the end they finally kind of Haplo actually calls Alfred his friend, and you know, it, which is a big step when you've had him in the, the way that he's been the last, you know, three books. So uh, this is one of my favorites because it really is the the defining of Haplo's character arc. By the end of this book, he's the the, the Haplo that we're going to love for the rest of the story. Um, that's Serpent Mage. Um, that is kind of the end of our, our the four books where you have one for each world. Starting with the next one and going forward, we're going to have kind of a mix of some worlds. There's a focus on certain ones here and there, but uh, there's a, kind of more about the overarching story of these, these dragon snakes and the evil they pose. And then... Haplo's Lord and Alfred and Sama and all about a lot of, a lot of stuff going on now that we've we've visited all these worlds and we'll get into those next. Book five of the Death Gate Cycles titled The Hand of Chaos. Uh, so in this one, um, 
we are back into the land of uh, the world of air again for a little while. This is all the way from back in Dragonwing, the first book. Uh, we get to meet our characters from that world again, uh, Limbeck and Hugh the Hand. Now, now Limbeck, who has always been kind of a peaceful, rebellious um, you know, person, but he has now united the dwarves and he is not so peaceful anymore. They are battling against the elves and the humans above. He pretty much... They're, they're, they were always kind of the source of water down there, and the elves and the, and the humans would always come and get water from downside, and, and the dwarves are like, nope, you can't do that, you know, we now control this, and, you know, we see that you live so well up there while we do all the work down here, and so now the, the dwarves and the humans and the elves are all three fighting against each other now, which is that kind of that chaos and that um, that, that Czar wanted, the, the Lord of the Patrons wanted Haplo to foster. Uh, so Haplo gets there and things are going as the Lord wants, but Haplo has changed. You know, Haplo doesn't, he sees Limbeck, he's like, you know, this is not the same dwarf that I met and I don't like how, how this has happened. And uh, Hugh the Hand has a, a really interesting story. You know, he actually, I, I don't want to get into spoilers about him as well, but there's a whole lot of interesting ways that Hugh the Hand is still part of the story uh, going forward. But um, so we're back into the world. There's all this chaos going on, and by the end of it, um, between the humans and the elves and the dwarves, all kind of are able to come to a kind of an agreement with really without any input from from Haplo or from the patrons or from the Sartans or from anybody. You know, it really is just you know they can overcome this, just like we saw in the world of Celestria. You know, these these groups can come together, and um, so this one is one of the longer books in the story, but the, it's it's a lot of. It's never been my favorite of the series. I think it's just because that, that that world of air, like I mentioned um, with Elven Star, where everything was getting kind of fantastical after that first book. That first book felt more grounded. It's kind of the same here. It's a little more, the story's a little more drab and more grounded and kind of more, I don't know, it's just a little slower, uh, especially after all the really great intense stuff that we've had in the first ones. Uh, this one just kind of slowed things down a little bit more than I liked. Uh, but it, it ends in some pretty interesting places. So kind of a... Uh, going into the sixth book, which is my favorite of the series. So, um, Haplo again, has, has kind of changed at this point. He's gone to his Lord and said, Hey, these, these dragon snakes, they are the true evil. We need to do something about them. But by this time, the dragon snakes have already talked to Lord Zar. They, they've taken the form of a, of a, one of them have taken the form of a patron. This one guy calls himself Sangdrax and, uh, which is supposedly the elvish word for dragon snakes. But, um, you know, again, these, these, these evil entities, they, they ingratiate themselves to you. They, they bow before you and call you master. And of course, that's exactly what the Lord of the Patrons wants. You know, that's what Lord Czar, that's what he wants. He wants to be master of everything. Um, and so of course that, that's going to kind of get him, uh, more on their side. So, you know, he kind of disbelieves Haplo and says, hey, you know, Haplo, go, go do what I already ordered you to do. I'm, I'm ordering you now to go back to the land of the air to make sure all the chaos and stuff is happening. Um, Bane is back into the story at this point, and he's going to kind of help with fostering that chaos as well because he's kind of the, the you know the the son of the, of the humans who tried to have him killed. And there's a whole again his, his whole story is very complicated and, and crazy as well. Uh, it does get wrapped up. His story does get wrapped up by the end of the book. Um, pretty much the story of the world of Air gets wrapped up by the end of this book, um, and then we're moving on to to alternate worlds and stuff as we go forward. Uh, biggest thing with this is this is a reintroduction of Hugh the Hand and Limbeck. Hugh the Hand is actually going to carry forward into the, the rest of the story. This is kind of the, the last that we see of Limbeck for a while, unfortunately. But great character. You'd love to see more of him. But Hugh the Hand does take a, a step forward to pretty much becoming one of our main characters from this point forward. Um, another thing the book five is missing is Alfred. Alfred is not in this book, which after all the interesting stuff that's gone with him and Haplo in books three and four is another reason why this one just feels a little less than, than those ones. Um, that being said, it sets up a lot of stuff with the the fight between the true evil of this, which is the, those dragon snakes and the and the just the evil entities that they are. So the sixth book and my favorite in the series is called Into the Labyrinth. And at the beginning of this, we're we're still kind of finishing up the last of the little bits of uh, of leftover threads from the world of air, and um, as Haplo is trying to leave. Hugh the Hand has been sent to assassinate him. So Hugh the Hand kind of jumps onto his ship to get him. At the same time, because the, the, the Lord of the Patrons finally feels that Haplo is, is not the same person he sent out, he feels betrayed by him, so he sends another patron to assassinate Haplo as well. This patron happens to be Merit, who is the girl, the woman, who Haplo partnered with in the labyrinth. Um, you call them girlfriend or whatever you want to call them, but it's a girl that he fell in love with. 
but she, who was also, you know, saved from the labyrinth by Czar, just like almost every patron has been, has loyalty to Czar and feels like Capolo has been a betrayer, he's a traitor, so she, she willingly goes to kill him. Um, so Hugh and Merritt and Haplo all end up on the ship together at the same time. Everybody's trying to kill everybody else, and um, Hugh has been given this magical weapon that 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 magically will transform into whatever is needed to win a battle. And it gets crazy, and they go through Death's Gate, and they end up in going to the labyrinth, and they end up going to a different world. And at the end of it, they end up in Celestria, and of course, the water in Celestria kills magic. So everything kind of starts falling apart, and then. Um, Haplo kind of just has this last moment of like, like, take me, he finds kind of this, um, white light through Deathgate, and Deathgate has this way of kind of taking you to whatever world you want to go if you think about it, and all he thought about was safety. And he ends up coming awake with Merritt and Hugh, and Alfred is in this place. And we find out that this is called the, um, I think it's called the Vortex, and it is the very center of the labyrinth. Uh, at the end of the fourth book, Alfred, whose people had kind of turned on him, had banished him to the labyrinth, and this is where he's been at ever since. That's why he wasn't in the fifth book. He was stuck in this kind of center area of the labyrinth. He has not traveled out into the labyrinth because he's afraid to, because the labyrinth is a murderous, awful prison, you know. Um, but now Haplo's there, Merritt's there, Hugh's there, Alfred's there. They decide that they need to try to escape the labyrinth. Haplo needs to try to... to get his lord to understand that the dragon snakes are the true evil and they need to fight against them. Um, Merritt slowly starts to to understand what Haplo is saying and sees the things herself and starts to kind of come around as well. Hugh's there for other reasons I'm not going to get into yet because um, I don't want to throw spoilers. I think his story is very, very um, complex and interesting. Um, and then, of course, Alfred is there as well. So they're kind of... What I love about this, this is almost the... Um, the, the Fellowship of the Ring, of Lord of the Rings, where you have this this crew and they're on their way on their travels. And I, I love that kind of story where you got this crew together and they're traveling around. Uh, some of my favorite books of the Witcher series are Geralt and his crew traveling around the world. Uh, this book is like that. You got um, Haplo and Merritt and Hugh the Hand and Alfred, and they're all kind of, you know, traveling through the labyrinth and fighting through the labyrinth and stuff. So um, by the end of the story, you know, the, the, there's things about the labyrinth that, that, are surprising to Haplo and Merritt. There, there's people that live, there's a, a city in the middle of the labyrinth that they didn't know about, like, um, and you find out some more backstory about that came to be, and the, the labyrinth itself starts to kind of do, like, come together to do battle. The, the, the dragon snakes have come and kind of gotten all of the different deadly creatures of the labyrinth together to attack all at once this place, and so it's almost like the, this great final battle in the labyrinth taking place. In the middle of all this, uh, Lord Zar is kind of doing his own machinations. He's gone to the world of uh, Stone, Abarak, um, to learn that that forbidden art of necromancy that Haplo did not want to tell him about. Um, because he feels like with an army of the dead, he'd be able to take over all the four worlds. It's one of the reasons why Haplo did not want to tell him about this thing, because he, he just knows that this is not going to end well. Uh, but, you know, he's got the dragon snake kind of helping him along through all of this because they, they all of this chaos and fear and everything they feed off of. That's what they want. So um, you kind of got his story. And then he finds out about this chamber that Haplo and Alfred found in the third book. And it is kind of known as the, the we find out that that chamber was where the Sardin came when they sundered the world. So he believes that if he goes to that chamber, he can remake the world into his own plan. So instead of taking control of the four worlds, he's going to put them all together to make one big world that he can control. It'll be under his image and his thoughts and everything. So that's kind of his obsession now becomes at this point. Um, and you, we've seen that the Lord has kind of got this obsession with power. You know, he sends half of the worlds because he wants to take control of these worlds. But now he can make this world his own world. But yeah, he's going to go for that. Um, but... The only people that he knows who knows how to get to there is Haplo. And so he needs to get Haplo. And uh, by the end of the story, you know, he's come for Haplo in the labyrinth. The war in the labyrinth is all raging on. And that's kind of where we end up at the end of this book. Um, I mentioned it's one of my favorites. I really do love just that kind of the foursome traveling through the labyrinth, that that kind of uh, crew on a journey feel. I really like it's my My favorite Tolkien book is The Fellowship of the Ring. You know, my favorite Witcher books are... You know, where Geralt and his crew is traveling around. I like that kind of story, so I think that's why I love it so much. And uh, the big final battle war reminds me a bit of, like, Helm's Deep and Lord of the Rings and stuff, too. You know, it's very, very cool. Uh, so In the Labyrinth is, again, one of my favorite ones, and that'll lead us into the seventh book uh, called The Seventh Gate. All right, so we get to the seventh book, The Seventh Gate, the final book of the series, and um, sadly, it's too darn short. 
<laughs> I feel like I've loved these characters so much. I want so much more to be happening with them, but pretty much we almost start with the, the end game already in place. You know, Zar has Haplo now. He, he, Haplo doesn't remember how they got to the chamber because it was dark in the catacombs. He has no memory of how they got there and stuff. Um, but Lord Zar says, you know what? Your corpse can take me because it'll remember. Uh, so he plans on killing Haplo, so there's some craziness going on there. During all that, in the labyrinth, Merit is still there, Alfred is still there. They're all fighting the the the, the, the enemies in the labyrinth, but um, they are able to kind of push things back. But they, at the same time, um, all the, the the dragon snakes and some other labyrinth enemies are fighting at the wall of the, the Nexus, which is that city that the patrons are able to go to when they escape from the prison. So now that city is getting attacked as well. Um, and so they go there to try to help there. Uh, Merit and Alfred travel to um, Abrek, which is where Haplo is at, because they want to try to get Haplo back. Um, Alfred is able to get Haplo, save him. And anyway, the, at that point, the rest of the story begins. The, the, they get to the chamber and all that kind of stuff happens, and your end of the book happens. Uh, again, slight spoilers, but I don't want to go too far into it. Um, by the end of the story, you know, um, again, I love this story. It's not, it's not Game of Thrones. It's not all of our characters are going to die or anything. I mean, we got a couple of losses here and there, but our main our main crew is still kicking by the end of the story, so there's a big spoiler for you. But uh, I love. I don't think it's too big of a spoiler to say, hey, these characters that you fall in love with are going to be okay in the end, you know? Um, and it ends up with um, just a kind of a final little chapter being narrated by Alfred about what him and Haplo are doing now and Merit and, and how they're living their lives and stuff. And I, 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 I love that. I love the kind of closure that we get on their lives i would love to have more stories with these characters and there's certainly more out there i'm sure there's probably fanfic out there about what these these guys do now i'm sure but i would love to have more stories in this world um but it is a, a good enclosed story these seven books really do make a great enclosed story um i just want more because i want more you know um but yeah the battle between evil and and good which you know the, really the good is very gray. I mean, even the Lord of the Patrons isn't truly evil. These dragon snakes, those are truly evil. And everything else really needs to fight against them and come together to fight against them. And by the end of the story, you kind of get that. And, uh, and yeah, a lot of pieces fall into place. And a lot of the, you know, the, the four different worlds kind of get into their zone. And, um, you know, it, it ends in a very satisfying conclusion. You just, you know, want some more time with your, with your favorite characters and all. But, uh, but yeah, so that's Seventh Gate. Um, again, I don't, I can't get into so much plot with it because it would give away a lot of where the books go. But um, I will just say that the characters of, of Haplo and Alfred and Merit and Hugh the Hand and Zifnab and Lord Zar, so well fleshed out. I mean, most of these characters, especially Haplo, seven whole books really, they really centered on this character and seeing his change from in the books two, one and two, you really kind of don't like this guy, right? And then books three and four, you start to gradually see this change in him. And then by books five, six, and seven, you're like, okay, this is the hero. This is the hero of the story. Uh, great, great character arc. Um, the character of Alfred, you know, you've got, you know, the beginning, he's this, this bumbling, oafish, um, you know, stumbling all over himself and gangly um, guy who you think is just clueless, right? And you get to like book four and you see, oh wow, this guy, this guy has a lot of dignity, a lot of power to him. By the you know, end of the story, you're like, this is probably the strongest magical person in the story, you know? So there's great character arcs for him. You got Merit, who, Merit is really interesting because other than flashbacks, you really don't see her through the first five books, but she kicks in hard in that sixth book. And the sixth and seventh book, she's practically one of the main characters. Uh, and she has her own little arc there where, you know, she is all, you know, focused on what her lord is telling her. Haplo's the traitor. She's got to take him out. And very quickly, because it's only really through two books, she kind of is able to progress and move along and kind of join on the heroic side as well. So uh, and then the Hugh the Hand, who I can't get into much because his story is just very, 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 very interesting. Um, I do wish in the seventh book that we got some more with him. I think there are some more stuff that we could have done with him. By the end, it's almost kind of like he's just kind of there, unfortunately. I think there's more to him, but his, his story is still really, really engrossing. Um, and then, yeah, it's just I love these characters. I love these books. And, um, yeah, all, all seven of these books are, are pretty much a culmination of my favorite series of all time. So uh, that we'll wrap that up with this. Uh, I'm not going to do another different Trump for the wrap-up, but... Um, you know, these books are, you know, again, probably not the best literature in the world. I'm sure they're not the most well-written things in the world, but 
I love them maybe because of the time I picked them up. They were the first first time I'd ever read seven books in this in a world like this. You know, I have since done like the Dragon Riders of Pern. I have loved uh, the Tiger and Dell Sword uh, Dancer books as well from Jennifer Roberson. The Witcher series, uh, Harry Potter, obviously. I've seen now bigger stories since, but this was the first time that I've had this giant story that loves these characters and really pulled me in and like I said at the beginning of this video when it was over I was sad <laughs> and even now you know years later uh, I've, I've, re I've reread these stories multiple times I listened to the audiobooks just recently and even now by, by the end of the audiobooks I was like I wish there was more <laughs> you know and then that's a good sign it means that you really 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 are enjoying it so um i hope somebody tries these out if you haven't um like i said don't go in expecting tolkien or rolling or you know fantastical literature but it's just an overall fun fun story i hope you guys would enjoy that so thank you for listening as always um we'll be back with a weekly recap by the end of the week for uh, stuff that i've done this week but uh, this is kind of a special episode covering uh, my favorite book series and i hope you guys enjoy thank you for watching talk to you later